Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the GPAC meeting. That works without fail at every single meeting. So welcome to our 26th GPAC meeting. Um, I am Matt Ramey with Ramey and Associates. Um, nice to see you all again. Um, I am going to hand it over to Rachel in one second, who is going to give a brief introduction. Rachel. Great, thank you so much, Matt. I'm just gonna step aside for the light. Good evening, my name is Rachel Diamond. I'm the Community Development Director at the City of Ventura. And I think Matt said this is our 26th General Plan Advisory Committee meeting. So thank you so much to the committee members who are here, as well as the members of the public. And I do wanna acknowledge our chair, uh, Council Member Doug Halter, and our Vice Chair, Council Member Bill McReynolds. Thank you both for being here. And um, I am thrilled to discuss economic development with all of you today. Unfortunately, our economic development manager, Meredith Hart, had an emergency, so she won't be here this evening, but um, we will um, you know, continue to work with our economic development team and with you and the community and the general plan advisory committee to, to continue to move this process along. Um, our next meeting is scheduled in April, and I believe the GPAC members have received um, an invitation online. At the end of the meeting, I'll go through all of the dates and the, and the um, topics, but I just wanna thank everyone again for being here, and let's get started. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so just a, a, a couple of things starting out. Um, you all know each other, um, all the members of the, of the GPAC. Um, our agenda tonight, um, after this brief introduction and welcome, we're going to have an um, economic development presentation by Doug, Doug Svensson, who is with ADE. He is our economist on the consultant team. Um, and he's been um, working in the county. He worked on the county general plan as well. Um, and he's been working in the city with us uh, on this economic development work. Um, we are, after a, a brief presentation, again, it's not gonna go into a lot of detail, um, similar to the last two meetings. Um, and then we'll have um, an opportunity for some questions from the GPAC. We will then have public comment um, and if any members of the public um, would like to speak, um, we have comment cards. If you could hand those to me, I would appreciate it. Um, we'll have two minute public comment. Uh, then we will have the economic development discussion. Like with previous meetings, we're planning on um, breaking into small groups and having you review the economic development um, policy framework, which was sent out in the packet. Um, and then we'll come back together for feedback and some discussion on some of those topics. And then we will adjourn um, at the end of the meeting. Um, these are our meeting protocols. Um, I'd like everyone to follow these protocols. We, they really haven't been followed um, completely in the past. Um, so this is sort of the group, the group warning. We are going to follow these protocols um, this evening. Um, and uh, if you have questions about those, you can, you can ask. Um, before we get into the background information, before I hand it over to, um, to Doug, I just wanted to give a couple of kind of quick updates on a few other things related to the general plan. Um, so we're all on the same page. So the first is that um, next Tuesday, um, we are going to the city council uh, for uh, a, giving them an update on a few things related to the general plan, including growth projections. Um, growth projections are a number that we look at for analysis for the EIR. We've talked through this. It's all based on kind of past trends and regional projections, some of which we'll talk a little bit about this evening about the regional economy. Um, but essentially, it is not a statement of policy. It is really a number that we look at for environmental review purposes and for infrastructure planning. Um, and so we'll be going um, uh, next Tuesday on the 26th. You all are welcome to be there. Um, we have two upcoming uh, General Plan Advisory Committee meetings scheduled. Uh, the next one is on April 16th. Uh, the topic for that one will be uh, safety and neighborhoods. And so safety, this is things like broadly emergency evacuation and fire, um, sea level rise, police and fire, um, and then neighborhoods. And neighborhoods are a follow-on topic for some of the land use for the single family and multifamily residential neighborhoods. So the goals and policies and actions addressing those. 
In May, we're going to be talking about transportation and infrastructure. That meeting is scheduled for May 21st. Um, we'll send out materials for each of these approximately a week in front um, before each of the meetings. Um, the next is that um, we are um, associated with the land use map that the um, city council um, endorsed with a few caveats. Um, we are going to um, put that map out for public comment. Um, and the idea is that um, we want to make sure that there are no mistakes in that map. Clearly, the city council spent, and you all spent a lot of time on what we call the areas of discussion, um, those we feel pretty confident about, that there has been a lot of discussion about those. Um, the rest of the city is an interpretation of zoning, and some people have said, maybe they think there wasn't the right interpretation. So in an effort to kind of get um, making sure that we have everything correct in the plan as we're moving forward, we're going to publish the map online, and then we're going to have a feedback form which will allow people to comment on specific parcels. So if you're a property owner um, and you think that a parcel, your parcel is, does not have the right land use designation, well, we have a form that you can fill in to identify um, what the parcel is, the, the actual parcel number, and then what you think that parcel should be. Um, so we have a, that's going to be coming out in the next week or so. Um, we're also going to have, as I mentioned previously, a series of sort of mini surveys or feedback forms on different topics, which will be coming out over the next few weeks uh, on, on each of the topics we're talking about at the GPAC and have talked about. So environmental justice, parks and open space, economic development, and then moving forward, transportation, um, safety, and neighborhoods. Um, so just keep an eye out for all of those. So, so that's just a kind of a quick update um, on those topics. Um, okay, so um, let's jump into economic development. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Doug, and then um, he'll give an overview presentation, and then we'll come back to some question and answer. Doug. Thank you, Matt. It's great to see you all this evening um, <clears throat> for our economic development discussion. And I just hit that. No, I'll do. Okay, great. Um, economic development is not a required element for general plans under state law, but uh, it is an optional uh, element. And many communities do choose to include it because they understand how important a strong economy is for the quality of life. And so there's a lot of areas, as you'll see as we go through, uh, the framework this evening that intertie with the land use element, intertie with infrastructure and transportation, and public services, among others. Um, so the framework includes a, uh, a lot of subtopics, uh, economic development, uh, which we might think of as job growth and, and business development, um, but also workforce development, you know, how do the people who live here, who work here, how do they access the new jobs that are coming in? Um, there's a strong connection to fiscal sustainability, so I'm gonna talk this evening about um, the city's budget and how tax revenues and city costs are affected by land use changes. Economic equity, making sure that the benefits of the growing economy are spread evenly and distri distributed throughout the communities. And then creating a number of what we call economic foundations, which um, include housing for, for workers, include services like broadband that's, that's uh, up to speed and modern, um, and helping the city make strategic investments in infrastructure and so forth to really support economic growth. This first part of the presentation, I'm going to kind of give a description of the city's economy and then move into more of an identification of issues and opportunities that have come up through the public input so far in the process and the analysis that we've gone through. <clears throat> Just as a snapshot, uh, many of you may recall that we did an existing conditions chapter uh, early on in the general plan process. Uh, so as of 2020, which is where we have our most detailed data, there were more than 63,000 jobs in Ventura at that time, and we estimated that was a growth of more than 5,000 jobs since uh, 2010, so over the 10-year period. 
That sounds like a lot of jobs, but when we compare that to the growth rate for the state as a whole and for the county, the city was lagging. So we were growing at a slower rate for jobs than, than both the county and the state as a whole. So that's an area of concern. But in terms of the um, main sectors and industries that create jobs, healthcare is the largest with more than 13,000 jobs. Um, the retail uh, sector is also very strong with about 7,000 jobs and then the hospitality sector which includes lodging, restaurants, uh, arts and entertainment, all the things that go into um, uh, visitor serving activities is pretty high at 6,400 jobs. One strength that Ventura has is that a lot of the businesses that are here have their headquarters here. So they're uh, management, executives, business owners are invested in the community because you know they live here as well, not just satellites. So uh, a lot of the uh, job growth in the in the city has been in in new businesses or businesses that have located here with their headquarters operations. And uh, as the county seat and with the county government center, there's also a high number of public administration jobs. So mostly county uh, employment, but a lot of other agencies as well as the city. Now looking at the labor force, so in terms of the people living and working here, we have a little bit more current information from the census. So as of 2022, there were um, 59,000 people that uh, actually are employed that live here in, in Ventura. So there are more jobs than there are workers. That's a positive ratio. And um, one of the standard ratios that we look at is how many jobs per housing units. And that is about 1.4 in round numbers here in Ventura, which um, exceeds the state average by a little bit. So in that sense, um, Ventura is a strong uh, job base. The problem is it's not growing as fast as other areas. Um, and so there's a question for the future, you know, will the city be able to keep up? In terms of the kinds of occupations that workers who live here are in, there's a heavy concentration of management. So that gets back to the company headquarters activities, but also business, science, and arts occupations. And of course, a lot of uh, healthcare workers, because that's the major job sector, um, and food service as well. About 69% uh, of workers who live here actually worked somewhere else. So, uh, and then turning that around, 72% uh, of the jobs that are here are actually filled by people that live somewhere else, probably in the county, but maybe. Some of them come down from Santa Barbara and so forth. So in round numbers, there's about 30% of the jobs where people actually live and work in the community, and the other 70% is in commuting. So one of the targets that we might think about, and in fact is, is built into the framework, is can we <clears throat> match the jobs better to the workers that are living here and maybe reduce some of the transportation um, needs through um, reduced commuting? Now, trying to look a little bit more detail at um, what's really driving the economy in Ventura. Um, we try to look at what we call economic or export-based industry clusters, and I know that sounds like a lot of gobbledygook from an economist. <laughs> but it's basically, we're trying to focus on those kinds of businesses that, where their markets are not here in Ventura primarily, but they're somewhere else. They might be global, they might be elsewhere in the county, they might be national or statewide, but the point is they're selling products and services somewhere else, and what that does is it brings revenue into Ventura, and it also helps pay the uh, wages for the jobs that are here. And so that's really what drives economic prosperity, is having strong export um, industries. So in Ventura, healthcare, business services, information technology, medical device manufacturing, food processing are some of the key ones that are larger and have that function of serving broader markets. Now clearly some of the healthcare is local serving. People that live here 
also access health care, business services the same. But when we look at the concentration of those businesses and, and industries and jobs, it's clear that Ventura is attracting uh, a lot of that activity from outside its borders. Now, another thing we like to look at is, you know, there are some businesses uh, types that are smaller now but growing rapidly because they're part of maybe the leading edge of new technologies, new markets that are opening up, and so forth. So we call those emerging clusters. Um, that includes advertising and marketing technology here in Ventura. Think Trade Desk as an example. Um, Advanced manufacturing, there's a number of smaller companies that are doing that kind of work. And then we also have the port and the commercial fishing that goes along with that, um, including the potential for uh, shellfish aquaculture and things like that. So those are all things that are not yet really heavily uh, concentrated, but they are showing great growth potential and they're, and they're part of, of future markets. So that's all in that one uh, category of, you know, large industries mainly that are driving employment growth in the city. Um, the second major driver that the city has identified is tourism. Um, attracts a lot of revenue from outside the um, community and we're going to talk a little more about some of those numbers in terms of just how much revenue. But as you saw in the, one of the earlier slides, it supports uh, the second highest number of jobs taken as a whole of, of any of the major industries in the community. And then the third is um, what we have called lifestyle. It's a, it's a combination of retail, personal services, entertainment. Again, a lot of that is local serving, but in Ventura, there's a lot of concentration of retail. Now, some of that retail is struggling, we're going to talk in a, a little bit about what some of the reasons for that might be, but um, when we think of what's drawing business into the community and what uh, is, is driving a lot of the economic activity, uh, it's in these kind of categories. And it, it's important as well because obviously it's a major part of the quality of life, how residents view their opportunities to shop and, and the entertainment and that sort of thing. It's actually a term that kind of covers a lot of these things. It's, it's uh, one of the things in retail is you, you may be aware that um, people are not buying things as much as they are buying experiences. And so a lot of the retail companies and other service companies are trying to attract um, through entertainment and experience kind of thing. So that's where the lifestyle kind of uh, terminology comes in. Yeah. Yes, so tourism supports a lot of three, absolutely, but then a lot of it is supported locally, not just people that live in Ventura, but in Ventura it's for uh, people that live in a lot of the surrounding communities come to Ventura for certain kinds of retail. And, and as we'll talk about, there's a lot of competition for that in Ventura County and Oxnard and elsewhere, but um, that's the separation. It's It's kind of... Um, three is sort of a subset of what drives two. Now another, for the general plan and the land use element, another important aspect of economic development is how that plays out in the real estate market. So just looking at office real estate um, and industrial real estate, uh, Ventura actually has the largest inventory of office space among all the cities in the county. Um, But a lot of that is older space, and so what happens is the rents are as much as 15% lower than the county average just because the age of the buildings, people, businesses are not wanting to, to pay as much. So that is a bit of an issue. Um, the vacancy rate, though, there's a lot of demand for it, so the vacancy rate is the second lowest um, in the county, I think below Camarillo, if, I'm re if I remember. Um, so there's a lot of um, important aspects to the office market, but there's also a lot of issues and opportunities that, that really should be addressed uh, because the, the inventory of space is, is out of date in a lot of, in a lot of ways. 
Now, um, industrial, uh, Ventura has the second largest um, inventory of industrial space, I think, behind Oxnard, but that's been declining. So there is a case where, um, for various reasons, industrial space has been redeveloping or going out of use. And so even though the inventory is currently high, it's on a, been on a bit of a downward trend. Um, Still, there's a lot of demand uh, for industrial space. Um, there's a lot of interest in flex and lab space because there's been um, some growth in biotech companies. And, and I mentioned medical devices earlier, but also the healthcare industry. Biotech is big countywide, and so a lot of those companies are looking at Ventura for potential locations. Uh, one of the things generally that's happening in the industrial um, market is the increase in e-commerce is driving huge demand for distribution centers. Uh, so trying to get uh, the last mile closer to where the packages are being delivered in the neighborhoods. And so um, their Amazon and those companies are looking at industrial space to fill those distribution needs. So that is also putting pressure on other industrial users who would also like to use that space. So there's um, uh, generally um, some conflict there and, and some tension in trying to meet all that demand. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears just a little bit um, and get into the connection between um, economic development and the city's fiscal health and its ability to fund services. <clears throat> this chart shows um, general fund expenditures. So general fund is a portion of the city's total budget. And you'll notice on the right that police and fire, so public safety comprises almost half of the general fund expenditures uh, for the city, uh, with parks and recreation and general city administration being other major components of it. The other part of the city budget that's not represented here is really dealing with the water and sewer services, which is, you know, maybe another whole component. Those services are paid for by monthly user fees, though, so they um, have a funding source that's built in to, to monthly bills that, that customers pay. But the general fund, on the other hand, is supported by what we call general tax revenue. So we have the property tax on the upper right, sales tax on the lower right. Those two are almost half of all the general fund revenues. Um, so those are directly related to economic activity. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sure. Uh, isn't that breakdown just a little over 30 or 40 percent? Yes. Uh, I would say so. I mean, most cities, you know, public safety is a major priority. Um, and so the other things generally fall out roughly like that. Uh, it's not unusual. <clears throat> um, so the property tax, sales tax, um, and the transient occupancy tax, which is the orange slice over on the left there, um, that, of course, is directly related to uh, ho hotel activity and so the tourism sector. Um, sales tax comes from the retail primarily. Um, so those things are directly tied to how well those sectors of the economy are doing. <clears throat> so that's one of the things that's it's important, not just from the quality of life standpoint, but from a financial standpoint for the city to consider how those sectors are doing. We did some analysis for the existing, existing conditions report to look at how a variety of land uses uh, contribute to the city revenues. Um, and so this is net revenue per acre, and what that means is we took what we estimate the service cost to be and what we estimate the tax revenues to be per acre for each of these land uses and you subtract them. Um, and most of those green um, bars means those are positive numbers, so there's more revenue than, um, than cost. But you'll notice on the left, the existing s single family is a red um, bar, so there we have a deficit, and I need to explain that a little bit. Um, most of you are aware of Proposition 13, which kind of um, 
freezes assessed values unless the properties sell again. So what that means is a lot of existing housing, their assessed value that they actually pay their property tax on isn't the current market value. So, so we estimated a couple years ago when we did this analysis that the average for single family houses was about 400,000, whereas the market, as you know today, is um, quite a bit higher than that. Um, so if you had um, new single family or new high density multifamily that are at current market prices, those generate enough property tax to pay for themselves for services, but the city has to base their budget on the total tax base, so that's where growth in um, industrial, commercial, office, hospitality, and new residential is important because without it, there's the potential to run a deficit. And, and a few years ago, the city had a structural deficit. Um, now that's been rectified, and I think the projections for the next five years show a, a very stable um, reserves, but that took a lot of work, I'm sure, at the city level, and it really, over the long term, requires you know growth in economic uh, development to maintain. Yes, sir. Yes, and sales tax. So sales tax is a big part of it. So if we think about all the retail expenditures that people make when they're here visiting, that's part of it. And you know, a lot of it on the <clears throat> non-residential side, I mean, so residential generates a lot of property tax. There's a lot of revenue, and, and we also give residents credit for buying locally. So the sales tax that they spend, even though that is a point of sale for the commercial, in terms of how the city gets it, in this analysis, we give residential credit because without the households, you wouldn't have the expenditures, so you wouldn't have the sales tax. But um, ah, what was I going to say with that? <laughs> um, the um, the real difference between these things is that it costs the city less to provide services to businesses than it does to residential. So if you think about neighborhoods, parks and recreation services, businesses don't really use that as much. That's something that the um, residents use. Um, the level of police service, the level of fire protection that's needed, it's higher in residential neighborhoods. So even though they do generate a lot of revenue, that net is not as advantageous as it is for a lot of the commercial and office and hospitality kind of uses. So that's kind of where that differential comes from. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of the, the, the jobs, the labor, the fiscal side of it. And then in the process, we've um, heard from citizens, from uh, business people that we've talked with, as well as the analysis that we've done, um, what are some of the key issues that the city really needs to think about and address in, in its general plan as it relates to economic development? So on the upside, we have strengths and opportunities, um, very high quality of life, people want to live here, businesses want to be here, um, that helps, you know, marketing and, and uh, keeps um, high interest in, in new business development, so that's an important. Strong economic base industries, I mentioned healthcare and business services. Um, these are all industries that have good growth potential, and that's important, so that's a, that's a good place to be working from. Um, some, some industries, I do a lot of work out in the Central Valley, it's not the same situation out there in terms of, you know, what they're, what their industry's growth prospects are. Um, numerous tourism and hospitality, hospitality options. Um, the city estimated in the last six months of 2022 that the city hosted 8.7 million visitors. So that's a, a, a large number and it really sh uh, speaks to the popularity of Ventura as a destination. Now there are things that can be done to improve that further, but it's a good place to start. Diversity of retail, the downtown is an asset for the city. It, it offers you know, a lot of um, interesting shops, a lot of restaurants, enter entertainment. It's a destination that people come to, so that's a strong asset. Um, there's a lot of diversity of retail because you also have 
the Auto Center, which is a major sales tax generator. You have the Pacific View Mall. Um, so you have big retail, you have small retail. Um, again, there's uh, room for improvement, but, but the diversity is important. Strong demand for industrial space, I mentioned that. Um, training and education institutions, so Ventura Community College is a big asset to help businesses get their workers trained uh, in, the, in the skills that they need to be successful. It's one of the major things that businesses look for when they're looking for locations is what, what are the capabilities of the labor force? The, you know, do they have the skill set that I need for my business? So not only uh, VCC, but we have in the region, we have UCSB, we have Channel Islands, CSU, we have Cal Lutheran, so some major universities. So business um, in general, I think, views Ventura as well situated when it comes to um, education and, and training. There are a lot of reinvestment opportunities, and particularly some of the older retail corridors. Um, so there are places where the city can work toward kind of um, renovate and innovate to future economic opportunities. And then the fiscal health of the community is strong, as I mentioned. So here are some of the issues that, that did come up, though, and we've talked about some of them already. Um, the mismatch between employed residents and local jobs. So can we get more businesses that, that can use the professional and management skills that our workforce has? here in Ventura. Um, and this is lack of space for significant employment expansion, and I know you've talked about the land use issues a lot up to this point, and the land use element is, is still to be uh, discussed further. Um, there's not a lot of greenfield development opportunities uh, for industrial and office development, so that in and of itself may limit um, potential for business growth. The office market in particular, because the, um, the business community is used to paying lower rents, if you build new office space, that's going to be more expensive. They're going to have to charge higher rents. And so there's, a, there's some um, potential issues there with trying to get some of that renovation to occur. Um, the high cost of housing, this is one of the number one things that uh, was mentioned to us by business people that we've talked with is... Uh, the, the difficulty in getting workers that they need because the housing is, is not within reach for, for many of them. Lack of lodging options. Um, there are a lot of hotels in Ventura. There are not very many at the upper end, the higher end. There are not very many that have really extensive business conference or convention facilities. A lot of the lower end and mid-range uh, properties uh, are badly in need of renovation and rehab, and so that kind of limits how well they do in the market. So there are a lot of areas where that could be improved, even though the, the inventory is quite high. Um, outdated re retail formats. Um, E-commerce, I mentioned e-commerce as it relates to increasing demand for distribution centers, but of course the biggest impact is what it's doing to retail brick and mortar stores. And so a lot of uh, even large stores like Macy's, for example, are, are reducing their footprints in new stores and, and moving a lot of their business to online where, where even their customers are ordering online and getting it delivered even though it's a Macy's operation. So that has a big impact on the real estate associated with retail, but it also means that the existing um, retail strips and corridors and stores need to upgrade and be able to um, um, handle the new kinds of retail that are that it's being developed, new kinds of businesses. Um, Another area that's come up in discussion is the uh, lack of access to the waterfront. So the waterfront is not just the harbor, but the whole beach area, the pier. Um, it's a big part of the tourist draw to the community. Um, uh, people have made comments that the visible appearance off the freeway is not the greatest from every angle. Um, the parking isn't always uh, uh, as improved as it needs to be. Uh, there could be better wayfinding, there could be, I guess the pier itself needs to be uh, restored and, and, and made operational. 
Um, in addition, there might be opportunities for shuttles and different things to really get people between the waterfront and downtown and maybe other areas that they want to visit in the community. And then finally, economic diversity um, is always important because as we all know, when COVID hit, it really hit the tourism industry, first of all, and then retail, of course, in a major way, and that had a huge impact on city revenues, sales tax, transient occupancy tax, all of that. So the more diversity that the city has in its employment base, there's a lot of tech businesses here. Uh, where I'm from in the Bay Area, we have a lot of tech, but, but we all know that the next dot-com bust could be right around the corner. And so it's important to understand the vulnerabilities of the business mix that you have and try to fill in as much as possible with things that maybe will weather you through the next economic downturn, whatever causes that. So those are highlights of some of the issues, and there's more detail in the framework that you received. Um, but based on that and with the economic background that we have put together, we have eight basic goals for economic development, and then within each of those there are policies, which I haven't uh, listed here, but basically supporting and expanding existing employment and, and encouraging a range of employment opportunities, improving the alignment between Ventura jobs and resident workforce skills, supporting the expansion of tourism, enhancing commercial fishing, aquaculture, and the visitor serving attractions and amenities at Ventura Harbor, uh, reinforce Ventura's position as a regional center of retail and personal services, and I should say entertainment businesses, I also want to mention um, um, there's going to be a separate arts and culture element in the general plan, so we, we did try to acknowledge that arts activities and businesses and, and cultural things have an economic place as well uh, in this framework, but there's going to be a whole separate element that's going to address that directly, so I want you to be sure and be aware of that. Um, number six, supporting economic equity in Ventura. Again, making sure that economic activities and benefits are, and services are, are widely distributed. Promoting the fiscal health of the city, and then finally creating strong economic foundations and aligning the city resources and entitlement processes. So that gets to the issue of permit processing, but also city um, investments and in infrastructure and services that are needed to support not only the residents, but the business space in the community. So in a nutshell, that's the uh, economic framework that we're asking for your input tonight and your discussion. And we're really looking forward to hearing your ideas on what could be included here. Um, at this point, I think we want to take questions. Uh, yeah, let's, um, questions? let's do a, a first Q&A and let's um, try and keep it to questions. Comments will, will come later um, and then we'll go to public comment. And oh, I got it. Oh, wow, we're doing it that way. We're getting fancy. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see who can get a microphone over to someone first. So, um, quick question. Uh, in the context, you talk about, um, you know, the jobs and the, the, all of that, right? And it's based on the most recent data, which was 2020. <clears throat> and the last figures were from March of 2020. And we had probably the largest disruptor for our economy in March of 2020. So how do we factor in that COVID disruption, knowing that kind of the world has changed since these numbers, right? right. And how do we make sure that given that, we're still looking in the right direction and focused on the right things? Right, great question. Um, <clears throat> we don't have, so the data that we have from 2020 is, very detailed and comprehensive. We don't yet have that same level of information about jobs um, that's more current. Um, but what we do, the, the figures that I've seen, and you, you may have other numbers, but just what I've seen, where there was at least a 3% drop in employment. I think a lot of that was focused in tourism and retail, and not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, looking at the city budget and the, and the, the most recent one, it, it appears that a, 
most of, not all of the sales tax is recovered. Um, the TOT is recovered, although I know that the occupancy rates are not quite still where they were. So people, fewer people are coming, but when they're coming, apparently they're spending more because the that revenue is. Um, so based on that, um, my expectation is when we get the detailed numbers, we'll see that we're pretty close to at least getting back to where we were. Now, your other question, which is a very good one, is what's changed and, and how is that going to affect things going forward? And that's where um, the, the, the pandemic greatly accelerated the whole drive to e-commerce. Uh, now, some of that's pulling back again, but at the time, it just went off the roof. And now it's, it's, it, it's, it was been accelerating for the last 20 years, and then it went up like that, and then it's come back down, but now it's back on its acceleration again. So it's going to continue to be an issue for retail businesses on how to manage the landscape of the fact that people are just buying more and more online. Um, so that's, that's there. So the whole retail sector is going to be permanently dealing with that for the foreseeable future. Um, the other thing is remote work, uh, which is, is, again, went off the charts. It's retrenched a bit, uh, I think, in most of the communities that I talk to. Um, but it's probably not going to go away. It's something I, I know I'm very familiar with what's, go what's going on in San Francisco. Very few people ever come in more than two or three days a week anymore. And so I think that for a lot of businesses, that's going to be what they're looking at. So obviously it has a huge impact on the office space market. Um, and so that's why it's one of the things I, I didn't talk a lot about when we talk about the difficulty of trying to address needs of office businesses, that's, that's part of it. Because we don't know what, what they really need from the standpoint of um, you know, space and, and infrastructure and those sorts of things. So those are a couple things that I know are going to have long lasting impacts. Um, and we've tried to uh, set up the goals and policies in a way to, to give the city some flexibility to address those things going forward, but we don't have all the answers today of how that's going to play out. Um, let's go um, to David. Can I ask members of the public to refrain from side conversations? It's hard for GPAC members to hear. Um, David. Uh, you cited a statistic of 8.7 million visitors annually. What year was that from? It was the last six months of 2022. Okay, so fairly current-ish. Yeah. Um, what percentage, uh, because 70 plus percent of the people that actually work here come from other cities, I'm assuming a large percentage of this is not tourists. It's people that no, come that, here to... That to was tourism, that, that number. The, the, that didn't account for just the regular commuting in and out. I think so that, my understanding is So that. the statistic is 23,000 tourists come here every day on average. on average. I mean, that was... The last six months, of course, includes the summer months, which is the high season. Yeah. It just sounds astronomical given what we see at our tourist locations. I mean... There's two or three hubs where those the would city, be. I believe the city accessed uh, cell phone data to to get that information and and get that. So, yeah. um, and I can't speak to all the details of how that data works, but I think that's where that comes from. Could you comment also because I saw in the in the supporting material a very large percent, something like 85 percent or more, don't stay overnight. The tourism is a, is a one-day effect and out. Right. So, uh, right. Can you speak to, I mean, you've, you've done this, and what a game-changer it would be if they were to overnight here or more. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons for trying to highlight where there are deficiencies in the lodging mix, you know, or in the con condition and performance of some of the lodging facilities because if that were improved and if and if we could get all the segments of the visitor market covered better then there would be a much better opportunity to attract people to stay overnight and of course their spending multiplies a great deal when that happens versus a day visitor and so that really is I, I think a major focus of um, businesses in that sector in the city is trying to find different ways of, of making that happen. 
So why don't uh, we actually, um, just to make this easy, why don't we just go around okay. the room? All right. Um, a quick question, a uh, question comment is, uh, in, when I look at uh, the data on job titles or professions, and I see what the average pay is, um, it, uh, we, we've known for 20 plus years that more people commute outside the city than uh, use, uh, work at the jobs inside the city. But when you compare the, that data, it was a little bit shocking to see that I don't think there's but maybe two professions that you make enough as one person to afford an average home in the city. So okay. it makes me wonder, now that so many people are working from home, are we, do we have people here that are working from home who are making a lot of money in the tech field that we're not counting yet? That's quite possible. Um, and um, obviously their incomes are, if they're in tech and let's say they have a job up in the Bay Area, it could be much higher than the average that is paid actually mm -hmm. by businesses here. Um, <clears throat> it, is, it is true that it's very difficult on a single salary to buy a house. I mean, that's true in a lot of places in California. So most of the time when we do that analysis, we, we actually factor in that there's, I mentioned 1.4 workers per household. That's kind of the norm. So if you factor that in, that's, that's why people can buy housing at all, because there's usually more than one income. To well, we, we, we've always wanted to see where people in Ventura are commuting to uh -huh. and what those jobs are and what they're making right. and seeing how we could get those jobs be located in Ventura. Right. You know, but I'm not sure how you go about that. Maybe cell phone data for that too. It, it's difficult to, to because you, um, there, there, there are some data that, that uh, get toward that, but it's, it's, it's only given on a pretty general basis. So, and it's part, partly a privacy issue, you know, in terms of disclosing people's individual information. Okay, could I get a, a clarification on goals and policies? We got 1.2, where it says in, encourage the expansion of industrial businesses into larger industrial spaces. We're gonna, we'll come back to um, goals and policies. Why don't you talk through the goals and policies and we can circle back. So let's focus on the, the data itself at this point. Okay, then I'm done. <laughs> Hey, thank you. Um, okay, I have a follow-up to Stephanie's question um, on the data. So you mentioned we like it. The level of detail that went into this came from March 2020. But like, is there a cadence to like how and when that data comes in? Is it like it happened 2020? Maybe every five years, some like detailed data analysis for economic development happens. Like maybe 2025. Do we have a sense of when that kind of thing would come in? There's a two or three year lag, um, so we're right on the cusp of, but also the, um, there's a difference between, not to get in the weeds too much, but there's publicly available uh, government data um, that comes out much quicker than that, but it's usually only available at the county level, and what's available at the city level um, doesn't count all the jobs that there are. So for example, that, that source only counts, um, I think it was like 55,000 jobs in the city instead of 63,000. So um, it makes it difficult to um, draw comparisons. Um, so what we have that we produce the $63,000 estimate, that's a paid subscription data service, so private. Where, um, so. So it's a matter of the city kind of, and, and part of the economic strategy that the city is working on, one of their action items is to invest in that kind of data technology. So that is something that the city has their eye on. We just don't have it in our hands right at this moment. It's not free, okay. Um, and then I have another question. Um, one of the slides that you had um, with the chart on ADE Inc.'s net city revenue per acre, since we have like economic development data per acre, yeah, yeah, that one. Since we have that, and like for the last three years we worked on the existing preferred land use that largely covered those like land land uses listed there. Can we apply that information to the map and see how well we did in terms of the before and after? Like, cause we made changes to office and retail and like other, you know, neighborhood center and stuff. Like, can we apply maybe what 
you know, that kind of, and then kind of map it out and see if what that would look like? Yeah, that, that kind of analysis is certainly possible. I don't know that it's included in the scope of work for the general plan, but it's the kind of thing that the, certainly could be done. Yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for this presentation. And I think my questions kind of go off of what Carbo was saying, um, where I almost wish we were able to frame the land use discussion that we had for two years in terms of economic development. I think I would have been, um, I, like personally, I would have been focusing much more on office space and hospitality opportunities in the city. So given where we're at with the general plan, I guess my question is more general, like what can we actually do with this information at this point? Um, Besides, is it just the goals and policies that we have now or? Um, so a couple of things. So um, first, this information actually um, was presented in, uh, I think it was September of 2021 right. for the Economic Development Forum that was part of a the GPAC meeting. So that information was was out there for this. Um, the the land uses are relatively flexible in some ways, so that even the like the, the light industrial flex actually allows for office. One of the reasons that we had an office R and D designation um, is because of this. Um, hospitality is allowed in a, in a number of the different. Um, a number of the different land use designations. So a lot of it is actually how the map is implemented um, in terms of, of economic development policy and action. So a lot of these are really, um, it, it wouldn't have, I don't know, I mean, maybe it would have changed your thinking on it, but I think really focusing, for example, on hospitality is something that can happen through, um, through the implementation of what's there now. So I don't think the opportunity's lost, in other words. That's helpful, thank you. Um, my first question is pretty granular, but in the goals and policies, it mentions card rooms as a major economic driver. Is that like the player's casino? Is that what we're talking about there? Fascinating. Do we know how much of an economic driver they are? I'm just curious. I don't know if we use that term, but it's a, they're revenue generators. Uh, okay. Maybe in that, in that yeah. sense. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Wow, fascinating. That's so interesting. Um, my other question pertains to hospitality and sort of the land use map and all of that, which is in terms of short-term vacation rentals, are we measuring those parcels as hospitality parcels or are we measuring them as residential parcels that then generate hospitality? How does that overlay work in this conversation? I don't think that was included at that level of detail. Yeah, I mean, it might be too. Um, I don't know how it pertains to the way the land uses are. Um. Um, so right now we allow short-term vacation rentals to be requested and applied for in any location where we have um, a, a dwelling unit, right? right. So um, in the future, if we, um, for example, limited that, um, it would you know, potentially eat into that TOT. That being said, when we look at short-term vacation rentals, we're seeing that they're part of our larger portfolio for tourists that include hotel rooms, right? Definitely. And so we're not at a place where our hotel occupancy rate is at 100%, so you're not having overflow into short-term vacation rentals. It's another option and kind of just increases the pool of available units. Um, as far as this, though, it's, when they talk about single family, it's just a standard single family and not particularly one that um, has short-term vacation rental with TOT. Interesting. Thank you. So <clears throat> my question has to do more with um, the economic equity issue that you brought up, and specifically in the sense of how we talk about the affordability measure. One of your charts shows that we're one of the least affordable uh, regions in the city of Ventura, probably one of the tops in that in that grouping. So my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is it's not just the price of the housing, but it's also the price of housing related to the average wages. Is that so? Correct. So then it's there's a certainly a mismatch there, and maybe part of what we want to be thinking of, is what kinds of in terms of workforce development, what kind of jobs are we trying to attract so that they can 
afford <laughs> better. Um, specifically, a lot of the jobs that we have are hospitality. Many of those jobs are, I would say, the minimum wage, but low, typically low wage, typically part time, no benefits. So it gets the issue of economic equity. How do we address that? Um, and then the other part was the, I think, related to this, is the um, the reverse commute. We see a lot of folks leaving to go to higher paying jobs, either in LA or other parts of the county or Santa Barbara, but living here. Um, I don't know if there's a question in there, but I think that's sort of what we've been seeing for a couple of decades at least, that's what I've been seeing. So just comments on that if you have any thoughts. Right, so absolutely there's a relationship between what the jobs pay and the housing costs, and we actually, that presentation that Matt mentioned a couple years ago, we we actually looked a few, at a few examples of what jobs pay and if we assume another worker in the household and what kind of housing can um, that household afford in Ventura and there were very few jobs that added up to um, you know buying a new house at the prices that are out there today so that that's certainly a concern and as you said you know the w to the extent you can target economic development to jobs that that do create those incomes, then that it's going to help there. Um, the the commuting issue is exactly what we were talking there. That you know, to the extent that we can um, try to match new jobs to the occupational skill sets that we know are here in Ventura, then there's a greater likelihood that that match will get made in the private sector, and and people will will live and work here more often. So and related to that would be the issue of um, the vocational or training, not just vocational training, but educational training as well, so that yeah. we're, we're focusing on training for yes. those higher level positions as opposed to training for more jobs in hospitality, right. typically lower paying ones. Absolutely. So that could be a policy threat. Yeah. So that plays right into my question um, on em employment and labor force. Um, if I'm paraphrasing this correctly, 30 about 30 percent of the workers who live here work here, and yes. about 30 percent of the workers who work here live here, roughly. Is that my correct? Right. How Round does, numbers. Right, give or take. How does that compare to the norm, say, of the county and the state? Uh, it's it's not that far off. Um, there, I've seen communities where that percentage is below 20 percent. So you're not as as bad off if you want to express it that way as other communities. Um, and, and so, um, you know, the reality is, people make choices as to where to live and where to work, um, and some people choose on purpose not to live where they work for a variety of reasons. Um, so, you know, it's not that we can control those decisions, uh, but we're trying to create the opportunity to get a, a better match. But that 30%, I mean, honestly, a lot of cities are right around that range. So, so it's, do you know offhand, for example, Oxnard? Is, that, is Oxnard in the same ballpark? I don't know specifically. I, I haven't looked at the other cities. We we did look at it several years ago, uh, but now I, I can't recall on the top of my head exactly how that played out. But um, I think all the cities in the county were not that far apart from each other on, on, that, on that metric. There's just a lot of back and forth commuting uh, throughout the county into LA and to Santa Barbara. One of your early pie charts showed that our revenue for the city, about 25% of it was from property taxation. Right. Um, interestingly, a uh, similar sized city, Simi Valley, sells twice as many homes annually than the city of Ventura because nobody wants to leave Ventura. Uh -huh. um, what, what would happen if that were to change? I mean, how, how is that? Um, that would drive up revenues because those houses get constantly reassessed at higher sure. levels. So, it, so I it, would expect their proportion, all other things being equal, to be higher than Ventura's. I guess my question is, is 25% average for cities our size, or is it below average? Um, it's you know why it's the reason it's hard to say is because it's a percentage. It depends on what other revenues cities have. You're 
actually fortunate you have a lot of sales tax. Um, and so in other communities that don't have the same level of retail, they have less sale tax, so property tax is a bigger percentage, but that isn't necessarily a good thing for them in terms of balancing their budget. So I hesitate to, to try to generalize on that because it just really depends. And you also have a lot of tourism-related revenues, the TOT, so all of that, in a sense, drives down the percentage of the property tax as a share of the total, but that's a good thing because it means you've got a more diverse revenue base. So, um, so in that sense, you know, it's positive. I'm very grateful for all the uh, uh, analytical work that went into the, the information that we received prior to this meeting. So I, I thought that was very well done. Um, that being said, I don't have any questions right now, but if you'll indulge me in one tongue-in-cheek comment. Um, I noticed in the Economic Development Policy Framework, there was the statement that the largest taxable sales category in the city is motor vehicle sales and parts, followed by food and drinking establishments. So it struck me that I think we'll need to be very judicious in how we advertise that our two biggest sources of tax revenue are drinking and driving. <laughs> per perhaps I'll have something more substantive to add later And you'll on. be here all week, right? <laughs> I guess my, I have a, what I would say is three questions uh, or comments. Uh, the first would be on this chart here in terms of hospitality well, I understand the per acre revenue is high, but the jobs are not. So it seems like we could, if we focus on hospitality, it's just, you know, we're cutting our nose off despite our face. Uh, absolutely. This fiscal is just one dimension that we look at. It, it doesn't get into job quality. It doesn't by itself get into numbers of jobs. Um, so there's a lot of other aspects to economic development. This is just one uh, slice that happens to deal with city revenue. And then my next question, again, still staying on this, is this is a document that's going to be for the next 20 years. I mean, where do we see office going over the next 20 years? I mean, is the, should there be a focus right. on office? I think Radius last week said that we have a 22% vacancy rate in Ventura uh, on it at their economic forecast. So I'm not sure... Maybe focusing on office is necessarily It's a also very good point. Yes, your point's well taken. This says nothing about what's the market for these developments in Ventura. This just says if you build it, if, you're, if there is a market and you build it, this is what you get. But there may not be a market for some of these things. And an office, as we've discussed, there's a lot of question about whether there's really a market going forward for more office space. Okay, and I guess it's really... I w just want this document to be looking forward yes. more than a snapshot in time today because, right. you know, I, I think the last time this document was updated was in 05, you know, and I think Amazon only sold books, you know, and, <laughs> right. and now they sell, you know, everything and, you know, they're, they're, you know, so I think we just need to be visionary in terms of our, our economic outlook. So and then my last question was... Um, the Economic Development Committee is doing an economic plan with Bill Fulton. Mm -hmm. Are you guys coordinating your two efforts? Yes, we, we are trying. I've, I've reviewed all their material. A lot of what you see in the framework uh, was, was uh, borrowed directly from work that they've done. So, yeah, we're trying to keep those two things in lockstep as much as we Great. can. Thank you very much. I've always got something to say. Um, fascinating conversations. I, I just wrote, I just got a page full of thoughts. I'll share a few that seem germane. Uh, first, I, my first observation is um, these challenges are not unique to Ventura. You know, most of this stuff is, we're in a time of change. Things have changed radically. Um, that's upsetting, that's challenging, and it's also full of opportunity, and I appreciate your comments very much. Um, about uh, thinking forward. Um, it's interesting that selling cars is one of our primary sources of revenue and fixing our streets seems to be one of our biggest problems. 
So how does that, how do we rectify that? And I, I honestly don't understand it, but I think driving around the community is a good way to find out how healthy their economy is. If we're having trouble keeping our streets paved, and we have a, a great public works department. They, they met with, with the port district not too long ago and talked about the fact that it's basically a 50 year cycle. It will be 50 years by the time they have paved every surface of street and then they will start over again. That's stunning to me, but you know, that's the way it is. Um, you mentioned that we don't have a lot of greenfield opportunity and that's certainly true and I think we're all, we all recognize that um, that's necessary, that there, you know, what green there is left, we're really trying to protect. We do, however, have a lot of brownfield. Uh, and I know that it's a, an, an area of contention, but North Ventura Avenue has been focused primarily as an oil area. And I'm just wondering about looking forward, how, what is the long-term viability of that? Not that oil's going to go away, we're gonna continue to use it, but it, it is land that doesn't seem to be used particularly efficiency, efficiently, it's in the county. God forbid we should actually try to you know, coordinate. And I know that there's been some discussion, but it can be challenging. But I, I wanna point that out, that it's an amazing opportunity, not for the same old stuff, but for something special. That's where the Chumash settled. It's an amazing place. The climate's perfect. Um, I, I think we've been engaging with them all to find out what they're thinking, because they must be kind of asking themselves, you know, what's going on for the next 20 years? Um, that would be a fascinating conversation to participate in. Uh, not that we need to, but I'm, I'm trusting that the city's having those conversations and asking some good healthy questions because there are places like that. Um, and as we've talked before, same with the county government center, it's in, you know, acres and acres of parking lots. So we don't have green fields, but we have you know, places that could change wonderfully for our community, and that's exciting. Um, we talk about you know the percentage of people who don't work in Ventura, but I would be really interested in how many of those people are actually staying in Ventura when they go to work. Because again, this whole thing about remote working, it doesn't mean they're getting in their cars and commuting. Um, and there's a lot of very interesting studies going on right now about how to make workplaces be places people want to be, rather than the traditional office. Again, you know, to, to go sit in a cubicle in a, in a room full of fluorescence doesn't sound particularly exciting, but there are companies that are really trying to retool and rethink that. And uh, that's something that we could get excited about. Um, so many things. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I'm wondering what it is. We know why we want to be here. The coast, the weather, the people are pretty cool. Um, the arts, the culture. But what? what would attract a business and what kind of businesses do we want to attract? And I guess that's probably one of the questions that most communities are asking themselves. Uh, but I'm really interested in that. And, and if we can figure that out, I think, um, you know, we've got the basis to put a good plan together. No, the, no answers. Well, they were all good points. I, I, I think you don't have to answer. It seemed like a really good segue to the group discussions that you're about to have. Thank you. No real question, except that I, I still didn't really understand the whole capturing of data, and the the question of the 23,000 people who visit the city on average daily. How we can, how are we differentiating a tourist from someone who comes here to work? Normally when I've seen these studies, they, they draw a line and, and it has to be someone who's coming from more than 50 miles away, which of course could, could pick up some commuters who, who might commute longer than that, but for the most part it's not picking up people that are, that are in the immediate region. That, that's, that's the one threshold that I've seen used for those kind of studies. So then it's because then that brings up a different set of questions, which is, you know, I mean, I think I consider myself a tourist when I spend the day in Ojai, right? So, um, and, I, and, and that's 10 minutes away. So, um, so are we, are, we actu are we accurately capturing that in order to understand who's coming here, why they're coming here, and whether it's for work or play, um, or both, right, in order to understand better how that interfaces with, with what we're doing? Right. Actual question. Um, I think 
there was a resolution. When Amazon first came on board and they were selling all kinds of stuff and we were losing all sorts of sale tax, um, there seemed to be some shift and adjustment in the regulations that allowed communities to capture sales tax for online purchases. And I don't know all the mechanics of that, but I think some, something to that effect happened. Um, what I'm wondering is, we would also get revenue from businesses when employees work in businesses within a community, and there's a, obviously a shared benefit between the business and the, and the uh, employee, and the community would benefit from the taxation of the business. I'm guessing at this point there isn't any thought or mechanism about capturing that kind of revenue share between remote workers and businesses that are, open, that are situated in Texas, for example. That's all controlled by state law, and I'm not aware that, um, I mean, so, so Ventura has a, a district sales tax, I think it's measure M, uh, um, and that does allow, so like if you buy a car in Oxnard, I believe Ventura gets that sales tax, but it's a limited set of transactions like that, and in general, you the city only gets what's spent at retail establishments that are located within the city still, even though there's been discussion for many, many years at the state level of changing all that, I don't think it ever has actually changed. Yes, well, it, I, I mentioned it briefly, but it, it definitely um, depresses, it tends to depress, uh, well, it depresses, um, Revenues for any land uses that don't turn over a lot. Now, um, housing, you know, in some communities, like people, somebody made the comment, nobody wants to leave Ventura. Well, so what that usually means is nobody's selling their house. So those, a lot of those houses were assessed many years ago. And uh, it can also apply to certain large commercial uh, uh, industrial stuff that, you know, if a company owns it for 50 years, then they're not selling it, then that same principle applies there too. But it, it generally just means that property tax revenues don't keep pace with inflation, whereas city costs in terms of services definitely go up with inflation. And so that's where cities get into a bind, that they're trying to meet expenses that are constantly rising when not all of their revenue sources are rising the same way. Not that I know of. That's a state level that again, question. That's a state law thing <clears throat> that would have to go to the voters. Okay, great. Thank you all for, for the comments. Um, we have, a, we're about halfway through our meeting. We've got an hour and 15 minutes left. We have public comment next. Um, I just have one speaker card. Is there anyone else who wants to, um, you could give the, oh, they're up here. Yeah. Okay, um, maybe we have more than one speaker. Uh, so we'll do two minutes per speaker. Um, anyone else? I have two cards now. They're over there. These are, these are the filled out ones already. Um, no, no, we're good. Um, okay, so we'll do that and then we're gonna break into, um, into groups. I'm gonna get my phone here. Um, Christy, you are first. Yeah, yes, it's the, it's the orange, yellowish ones. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, I think it's tricky to talk about number of people driving out of town for work because um, you have to realize that all of East Ventura is way closer to Oxnard than they are to downtown. So if the people that live in East Ventura are driving to Oxnard to work, it's actually closer than staying within our very long city boundaries. So, And um, my son started a company and their headquarters is downtown Ventura, but you know, since 2020, he now has one of his main staff people decided to move to Italy, um, still works from Italy, and then another one is in Seattle. And so it's, it's really tricky to look at those numbers. Um, I wanted to talk about one of the threats up there that I thought was missing on the chart. Um, we, in, in, I think it was, um, you had drivers number one, two, and three, and the drivers 1B, 2, and 3, um, all are, I think, fairly dependent on our coastal location. Um, you know, tourism, wanting, people wanting to work here, it's because we're coastal. And 
One of our biggest threats right now is our coast. Um, we are having major impacts of climate change, you know, waves, storms, and our promenade's falling apart, our um, fairgrounds is falling apart, the parking structure is falling apart, the marina park path that goes to Soder Point is falling apart, the Surfers Point path, the pier, San Juan and Harbor, these are all falling apart, and it's because we are having a lot of impacts on our coast. And that is going to have a lot of impacts on the city budget to have to fix those things and a lot of impacts on our economy in general with tourism and so forth. So I would love to see added to there not just the lack of access to the waterfront, but the condition of the waterfront. And thinking in terms of our city's future economy um, and what all of those impacts are going to be. I sent you guys an email um, with a link in it that showed a um, flood map that you can, it's interactive, so you can click on different things, USGS information. You could see what the future of our coast is and then plan accordingly. Thank you. Okay, um, Helen, you are next. Good evening, everyone. Um, okay, I'll try to make this quick. So I'm proposing an amendment to policy 1.2, industrial in expansion into larger spaces. I would suggest that if we're gonna keep that exact language, I would add a provision to encourage retaining a local or similar business to ensure that those industrial zones are preserved and utilized continuously. My second comment is the West Side could be added to the list in the policy recommendation number one. We are an incubator zone in the making. Um, I absolutely love policy number 6.2. Thank you for acknowledging the need for career pathways at local businesses. Um, I think it's no secret that I am a champion for a vocational training facility on the west side specializing in um, special education. And I think that directly fits in with our project goals. Um, my last comment is I would be interested in seeing a policy goal or study analyzing issues or barriers for small businesses um, that they may be facing when competing against the transnational corporations. And I think the same kind of study or endeavor could be undertaken for those of us looking for a chance to buy a home but also facing that same competitor being a transnational corporation. Thank you. Okay, uh, Pete. Hi, should I go over there? Oh, you can go where you want. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> <laughs> nice mic. Um, Pete Cazenza, uh, 71 year resident. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody? Um, hi, Christy. And I know, I know Doug and I, I know Nicholas. And everybody else I don't know. But nobody told me that the golf group wasn't going to be here. I've been out of town. So I'm, I'm here to represent, but they're not here. So I'm going to take the opportunity to pre, whatever the word is, because we got bumped to April 9th. Now, where's the mayor? Are you the mayor? <laughs> Do we have a mayor? Do we have a city council? OK, so am I addressing them? No. Who am I addressing? Every, this is a this is a general okay so parks and recreation it comes under the golf course Olivas Park and Buena Ventura are fine golf courses that the city has ignored for many years they've tried and before they built Olivas I think Christy will remember right over here one day we talked about how they were going to ruin it we used to have a nice pro shop, we had a great restaurant, we had a bathroom, believe it or not, we had a bathroom. Now we have a mobile home that you fall through the floor if you're not careful, and it stinks. And nobody cares, apparently. Because the group that I'm not representing but I'm a part of has been trying to get some recognition for many years. And somebody took a bunch of money and left, and we all know that, and it's an elephant in the closet, but that's not the point. The point is, you guys are making money off the golfers. We pay the market right to play golf, and we get zip. 
they, they forgot to build a pro shop, they forgot to build a restaurant, they forgot to build a bathroom. And we need that. And you're trying to make it a destination, what do you want? Time. What's Two time? Minutes. Can I extend? Nope. Two minutes per person. Sorry. Okay, um, so next is, um, any other public comments? Oh, come on up. What? Oh, I didn't see the golden ticket. Hello, I'm Cherie, and I'm just responding to what I heard tonight. Um, these are first draft thoughts. So I appreciate what Nick said and Bill about having some vision and who do you want to attract to Ventura. And I think we need to back up and look at that. What are the strengths of Ventura? We have an amazing environment here. It's beautiful. So one thing we could do is have a vision to attract outdoor companies. If you look at a lot of uh, packages, like vitamins and health stuff out there, you'll see so many companies are in Utah and Colorado and Oregon and Washington, and these are expensive places, though people are still moving there. They want to work for these outdoor companies. I think we could use that asset. I want to also say attracting families. Okay, I just learned that the average age in Ojai is 50, the average age in Ventura is 39, and it's only going to go up. We're going to hit 50. Um, I didn't see education mentioned as one of the main drivers of our jobs. And we, why not grow education? Why not? Um, we need to attract families. And so families will move and they will sacrifice to go to a community that has strong schools. So we need more community partnerships to strengthen our public schools, work together. I just went to a seminar that at the Office of Education. There's so much out there. Um, we need uh, uh, supporting our green space and our parks will attract families here. So let's ask the question, what kind of companies do we want to attract to Ventura? The driver number three, innovation, and who do we need to fill? I think we need to be looking at the next generation and really put that into our vision. It'll help our schools that are shrinking. It'll revitalize your economy and uh, bring a lot of energy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is that it for public comment? Anyone else? Okay, uh, we have, um, it is 7.25. Um, we have until um, 8.30. Um, what I'd like to propose is that we break into small groups as we've done before, uh, and the GPAC looks at the policy. Tell us what you, um, actually, can you go on to one of the next slides? I have some of the questions up there, I think. Uh, next one. Next one. Next one. No, maybe. There it is. Um, found it. Um, so what are all of the topic areas covered? Is anything missing? Is anything um, misrepresented? Um, is there a different direction you think we should go? So some of the same questions that we asked before with the other um, policy frameworks. Um, what we're looking for is just is feedback on this. Are we sort of, are we going in the right direction? Again, are there specific things that we need to um, have included that we didn't include? You know, this is this is a pre-draft, so we don't expect this to be perfect. We want your comment. We want your feedback with this. Um, so what we'd like to do is to break into um, into maybe three groups of five um, or or four groups if you choose to do it. I think it's up to you how you all want to do that. Um, and then for members of the public, I, um, I know that some of you have a lot of ideas about this, so I'd actually encourage you all to, if you want to, to break into groups as well and give comments. You can give us written comments. We're not going to do feedback, um, report back from the public. But um, if the public wants to give comments, please give those to us tonight um, as well. So um, does that sound like an okay plan for the group as we've, as we've done before? Um, and I figure we'll have about 35 minutes, so maybe we go until 8, um, 8, 8, 8 05, and then we can come back together, just give some highlights coming back um, when we come into the large group. Doug is going to hand out what is the official comment form, which is actually just a copy of the policy framework. But if you could write your group's comments in there so that we can at least get that back. You can also do it individually, that's fine. However you give us feedback and ideas is great. Um, and then 
Um, <clears throat> if you have questions about anything, Doug and I will be available. Okay? So go ahead and self-select groups.
Okay, let's all come back together. It's 8.10, 8.12. I let you all talk for longer because you were having so much fun. Okay, who wants to start with feedback? Okay, okay. Let me do my magic trick. Shh. Works every time. Okay. So let's um, each group spend a couple of minutes, and we have about 15 minutes left. Um, we will record all of the comments, hand them in. If you want to give us more written comments, we can send a Word version of this out. If you want to write comments in there, just let us know. Um, and let's see where there's overlap. If a group has made the same comment, just ditto. Okay, uh, I'll try to go through this quickly, but I feel like our group, uh, we covered a lot. Okay, so starting with ED1, um, 1.2 and 1.5 definitely stood out, but for 1.5 entrepreneurism, um, refer there was reference to VUS, the model out of VUSD's West Side Vision, so definitely like um, focusing on clean and environmentally friendly businesses. Um, for 1.6 emerging clusters, one of the terms that kind of our group talked about was economic gardening and like tying very closely to also 7.4 and 8.6. So 7.4 being um, development impact fees and 8.6 being streamlining permitting. And really the thing there is like making sure that Ventura is flexible to changing markets and making sure that businesses can easily come into the city and work for cities. Can we steal jobs from other cities? That's what we want to do. Galita looking at you apparently. Um, then, okay, so being flexible and then definitely just like offering incentives, like figuring out ways of, you know, tying, again, 7.4, 8.6 permitting fees, you know, um, other fees that businesses have um, in terms of starting you know, in Ventura, um, land use flexibility again at 1.7. So flexible, flexible, flexible was talked about a lot. Um, moving on to 1.4, 1.14 agriculture uh, in honor of Louise. I feel like including housing in there. Um, she's always bringing that up, but we did too. Uh, 1.15 McGrath property. Um, uh, we spoke about how there's already, City Council has a specific plan for that, um, but office R&D and industrial, how will that influence the uh, land use, its visioning process. Um, and then we wanted to add a 1.18, um, which is basically the same as 1.17, but specific to the west side, uh, quote, continuing to nurture diverse businesses with head of household jobs on the west side. Um, so that was something our group feel like needed to be added. Uh, looking at ED2, um, we had a conversation about just the language behind living wage jobs and like either updating that to thriving wage jobs or uh, folks are talking about head of household jobs. Uh, maybe just, I don't know, moving away from that term uh, given, um, yeah, its definition. Then a uh, policy program connected, oh, um, in ED2 looking at uh, Ventura Community College, we had chats. LIDA maybe being so strong because of its tie to um, UC Santa Barbara and really just figuring out what the future of you know workforce training and what the power of Ventura Community College is to the city and you know either its nursing program connecting to the medical industry in Ventura or even given um, the size of the county government seat and just you know city uh, city jobs like is there a policy kind of education center or um, think tank that could be in Ventura that's or tied to the college that then connects to those jobs something like that um, that could come out of Ventura Community College going into the next section ooh, um, ED3 huge conversation on the waterfront connections 3.4 and 3.9 the fairgrounds and those were both connected uh, by capping the freeway, which is really around 3.8, beach access and parking. Um, we had conversations about um, 3.8, including water taxis and shuttles. Um, and 3.8 is also really closely tied to 4.1 in that we just need to like highlight, highlight, increase the font of inviting, and that being via access, you know, transit, trails, roads, getting folks 
over, under, around the 101 to the ocean um, and like figuring out how to really, the Pacific Ocean is 10 out of 10, we love it. Um, uh, Ventura Pier 3.5, huge conversation about the parking structure and investing in that plot to um, uh, get more value out of that. Um, then uh, 4.3 got a special star, uh, we dig it, we love it. 4.4 was something that we wanted to add in, a fourth one to ED4, just um, to Christy Weir's earlier comment uh, about the resilience of our coastline um, and just figuring out you know, when those <laughs> uh, big waves come in that end up being on national news like and the erosion of our beaches, just how can we make sure that our businesses that are on the coast and that all the people who love using the coast and the value that comes from that, how can we make sure that it's resilient? Um, looking good, feeling good, 87, um, yeah, again, uh, figuring out incentives for businesses in terms of impact fees. And then 7.5, um, there was an interesting conversation behind the second half of that in terms, uh, quote, specific plans to ensure that ongoing city service costs are mitigated. Um, that was quite contentious, that half of the sentence, um, people think that Doing specific plans can, in some cases, kill opportunity, and they're too expensive, they take too long, and so maybe uh, some folks in the group thought that we should remove that. And then, again, 8.6, alleviate time and expense, wanted bolded, underlined, and increased in the font size. Seven. Oh, 7.4, I missed something. Get rid of net zero oh, yeah, development impact fees, net zeros, just incentives for businesses to be in Ventura. Are we doing a line by line? All right, I'm taking a page from your book, Carva, and I'm going to blow through this. All right, uh, ED1.2, um, we were confused by that because we're under the impression that we're already sort of tight on industrial space, so large format industrial doesn't make a ton of sense to us. 1.4, um, again, Again, sort of like, is this a priority? We hadn't, we did have mixed opinions, but in light of the way that office space is changing and its uses, is that something we specifically want to build into our plan? Um, oh, I gave 1.8 a gold star. 1.14, we also wanted to honor Louise and call out housing um, and also call out the industrial element required to support agriculture if we are deciding that that's a specific economic driver that we want to encourage within city limits. A um, McGrath property, uh, oh, we wanted to specifically maybe build in a focus on diversity of uses on the McGrath property that rather than one single use um, to sort of bolster the city's fiscal outlook there. 2.1, um, we wanted to include more potential partners in the training coordination, like Women's Economic Ventures, the Technology Development Center, and the Idea Center. Um, we also think maybe we should include an element calling out trades and like vocational training. 2.3, uh, we thought maybe we should expand and include trades in that as well. 3.4, we agree. It, the waterfront connections need some love. We specifically called out lighting along the promenade could use a little bit of a hand. Kyler, shockingly, loves 3.6. Um, <laughs> his argument, which I think is a very good point, is that if we are going to keep the golf courses, we should invest in making them a functional, useful space that's desirable and can actually help our city economically. Uh, 3.7 state beaches. Oh, that's, I gave it a gold star. Um, 4.2, also Gold Star, Channel Islands National Park is a really underutilized resource for the city. Downtown, 5.1, we called this out as one of the most important parts of this whole economic development plan. Um, we said maybe, I don't know that we include this in the policy language, but Pearl Street and Boulder is a great example we could look to. Um, we maybe want to include an element as we're talking about like pedestrian oriented, diverse retail, all that, including something about safety in downtown. And maybe we want to specifically call out Front Street as a part of downtown that's ripe for development and opportunity. Um, 
In case you didn't already guess, I'm hung up on the card rooms thing on 5.6. Uh, maybe we replace that with Players Casino if it really is the one, since we're specifically calling out Ventura Auto Center as one thing, Pacific View Mall is one thing, unless there are other card rooms I don't know about. Uh, 6.1, emphasize training for jobs that pay a living wage, specifically living livable in Ventura. We think that's important to include. Um, 6.2, we wanted to call out training for the trades, union apprenticeships, etc., and maybe even include something, and we know that the feasibility of this is pretty complicated, but about local hiring requirements for new development and reinvestment projects. Uh, almost there, 7.1. <laughs> oh, um, was a little contentious in our group, but is office and R&D really the future that we want to be focusing on as a city? up for debate still, but we did uh, have some discussion around that, so I'll call that out. Um, 7.5, Gold Star, we like that the city's going to look at bigger projects, which is interesting, because that was one your group was not so sure about. Uh, 8.1, housing. Oh, mostly this was a language thing, but if we're calling out executive housing, but then we're also specifically saying that we want a diversity of housing, should we also be calling out housing on the other end, end of the spectrum, like farm worker housing and things like that, just feels weird to specifically focus on high value housing in that. And 8.3, like the idea of investing in something that gathers market analytics, I think that could be advantageous to local businesses. And with that, we're done. <sighs> Did I miss anything, group? Right on. So um, there was a lot of overlap, so I'm not going to go over the things that we um, ag agreed with other groups on. Um, but I will just say there were a couple of areas. Um, on 1.3, we questioned, um, or sorry, 1.4, um, the need for these large office developments when we've been talking about the fact that office work is changing and people are going to remote, like why specifically these um, mega developments. And then also in 1.3, um, whether or not to focus industrial and office space along the freeway makes sense um, because most of our freeway is close to the ocean. And so it's that might not be its highest and best use as if we're comparing it to residential. Um, we talked a lot about kind of how do we create the innovative economy that we want to have in Ventura and looking at what does that look like for us 20 years down the road. Um, didn't feel like that was necessarily re reflected um, in some of these goals and policies. Um, we talked about bringing broadband from section eight into uh, the first section um, since it seemed to kind of relate to um, business and uh, building an infrastructure for business, um, agreed with the adding workforce housing to agriculture. Um, in section two, um, we call out the community college, I think we should also call it the school district, um, and where it relates to um, career technical education, the school district is doing a ton of work around this, including things like we now have programs to train first responders in our high schools. So those sorts of things are how we grow our own for our workforce, um, and that should be highlighted in here. Um, I, spe I specifically said look at the website, you can see all the CTE programs that we have. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the language in here being kind of passive, like encourage, um, maintain, instead of kind of giving really active and specific kind of actions um, throughout the document. Um, section three, um, if we are going to focus on being a more an overnight destination, um, obviously we need to think about infrastructure. Nick had a, a great idea about um, viewing parking as a way to um, kind of create buffers to potential flooding along the coastline um, because as we look at like the, the fairgrounds or other hotel developments, if we bring things up by putting a parking underneath, um, it can give us a little bit of a buffer for those times in the year when we get a lot of rain. Um, 
And then we wanted to specifically call out more specifically the issue of coastal impacts um, from climate change because it didn't seem like that was specifically addressed. Um, and we talked about public and private partnerships for the golf course. And we spent a, quite a bit of time talking about the fact that we all lament the fact that no one is talking anymore about an outdoor amphitheater in the hillsides as part of the botanical gardens, which I'm just going to put that plug in. It was part of the original plan and would be wonderful to have our very own Santa Barbara Bowl, but in Ventura. Because um, I would really encourage use of downtown. <laughs> um, and then uh, for number four, um, Bill mentioned that the harbor has a, a kind of clear vision for what they want to do and maybe we should focus on removing obstacles and kind of getting out of their way of allowing them to develop and, and live out that vision. Um, I like the idea of adding Front Street to number five. And then we didn't get very far past that, except that um, on number six, again, include the school district where you're including the community college. Wow, that was a lot. Um, well done. Um, are these all written down? Because my hand hurts, and I'm not sure I actually kept up with everything. Um, yeah, so please. Um, okay. Um, great. So, and then um, from the members of the public, if you all have additional comments, please hand those up to us as well. I know we got some already, but please give them um, as well. All right, we are like 30 seconds, one minute from ending. Um, our next meeting um, is going to be on April 16th. Um, safety, which we'll touch a little bit. A few people came up to talk about the local coastal program and sea level rise and um, so we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit at the next time, although not in, in huge depth. Um, and then neighborhoods, uh, yes. So the main meeting is on April 1st, not the 13th? Correct. Okay. The May meeting is on the 21st. Um, we'll send out, do you all want us to send the, this in Word so you can write some more comments in there? Would that be helpful? Yes, okay. Um, so we'll send that out if, if you so choose, you don't have to. Uh, and then, We'll write these down and, and make changes to this. They're, they're great comments. Um, any parting, closing thoughts from anyone? Questions? Questions, comments, concerns? You. Should be May 21st. We'll check it. Yeah, we we did move it to the thirteenth. Oh, yeah, so it's 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 a Monday, May thirteenth. Well, let's we'll confirm that for all of you to make sure that that still works for all of us and and for all of you. We decided we're taking over the council meeting for GPAC. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Yeah, we know two who will be here. Um, okay. Anything else before we close? Okay. Great, thank you everyone. Have a great night. And, and thank you to Doug for all of his work.
but a lot of the stuff is like, yeah. We'll give you plenty of No, I know. Of course. We had a talk the other day. Rachel said April or May, but then you brought that up and it was coming back. And then I was just, just clarifying.